Thank you all for coming to this session. I know there's a lot of competition, and uh, I had a hard time coming here to make my own presentation, <laughs> given the other sessions underway. Um, so our topic today is uh, workflow. Uh, we, Roger and I are taking uh, this from the perspective of a, a strategic perspective. Um, and our main, in the end, what we want to do is hear from you. But let me give you a little bit of context. Um, I will quote, I think I'm quoting Workin Dempsey, who uh, has been saying that workflow is the new content for some years. Um, I think we uh, are seeing that over and over again, uh, and there's lots, lots of evidence of this, uh, even in Joan's talk, when she was talking about the 21st century skills, uh, it was about research as a process and understanding that process. Um, there is much afoot in the uh, tech world about workflow. Um, Mellon just implemented a new grant management system based on workflow. Um, the uh, ServiceNow platform for user service uh, is also based uh, on workflow. It's all over the place. Um, the concern that we're raising here is in the academic sense, uh, who is controlling this research workflow? And I will give you a little flavor of why we think that's an important question. Uh, and uh, because it has been such a, a growing and important topic, our, we really want to try to take a deep dive and try to get into some concrete issues here about what workflow means, how it instantiates itself in dis different disciplines. We're not going to be by any means comprehensive, uh, and, and so why we're inviting um, discussion following. But we want to ground a discussion uh, more uh, firmly so that we can uh, address the, the, what, what we think are really important strategic questions uh, a, a little better. Why me and Roger? Um, kind of random in some ways, uh, not so random in others. Uh, as you know, Roger's been publishing uh, on this topic in Scholarly Kitchen and elsewhere and, uh, for some time. Uh, and my uh, team at Mellon have been forced to focus on uh, workflow for a variety of reasons, some of which will become apparent as, uh, uh, as we present. So in a way, we've appointed ourselves as, uh, to lead this discussion. But as I said, our main purpose here is to invite you uh, to join in that discussion, and we'll try to be um, uh, quick about our, uh, the thoughts we want to present. So let me start. Mellon, uh, at the foundation, I've been defining uh, scholarly communications in workflow terms for some time uh, with the idea that this, at the center of this workflow is the stuff uh, that scholars work with, uh, the cultural and scholarly record, and that there are a variety of processes uh, discovery and access and the use in teaching and research, uh, the publication process, there, there we go, sorry, publication process when uh, research insights are developed and, uh, and generated, uh, they're published and they become part of the, uh, the stuff and uh, the preservation of that record over time. Each of these are processes and part of the uh, overall scholarly communications workflow. What we've observed, though, is uh, that in the, uh, before the 1990s, there was only a small uh, kind of uh, external interest in, this, uh, in these workflows, um, with OCLC and ICPSR uh, kind of providing, aggregating services of various kinds. Uh, as uh, time has gone on, these uh, outside services have become more interesting and more prevalent until now we have to break up these parts to really capture the external interest in those um, processes. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here. This is just what the, the world has begun to look like. If you look at the publishing area and, um, and in the preservation space as well. Lots of third parties offering various kinds of services I think it's probably worth um, observing that a lot of this action and movement is the movement 
uh, of scholarly work to the cloud and the way that you afford uh, business in research now is you have to be able to take account of the cloud nature of it. That's cross-institutional, that's um, it's digital work that uh, needs to be preserved and, and produced uh, and managed. Um, and this movement to the cloud has required a different kind of economy. And what you're seeing in these slides here is a kind of representation of that economy. I'm going to hand it off down to Roger um, to, to take us a, a next level uh, into this workflow idea. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, so Don's, Don sort of shaped, shaped out very nicely sort of some of the large scale changes that we've seen over the last few decades. And the dynamics that we're seeing today that, that we're all living through is that the, the workflows, the platforms and systems that support scholarship from the very beginning, the inception of a research project all the way through uh, its completion and indeed its post-publication um, life cycle um, is clearly becoming of, of growing importance to the scientific research enterprise. I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to really focus on the scientific research enterprise in my remarks, but, but the universities that see science and academic science and clinical medicine and, and other related fields as really the direction forward from their perspective on, on the research side. Um, if you, you know, if you think about a, a kind of schematic of what a research workflow for laboratory sciences might look like, this is just illustrative, not comprehensive, and probably not specific to any individual. But what we're, what we're really trying to call to your attention is the whole process that might, you might see it starting with current awareness, moving through the design of a research project, the, the search for funding, the efforts to find funding for the project, the collaboration around research, the movement, um, you know, through all sorts of things, experiment design and data collection, and all the way through analysis, writing, sharing, you know, you can see the whole process through publication and eventually showcasing an assessment. Um, this is a process where the academic library falls in, in only maybe two or three or four of these boxes, depending on how you, you see things working at, at any given institution, um, at least traditionally. And so there are some really interesting questions about how, as this process becomes platformed, or as Don said, how it moves to the cloud, who provides for the different, the different stages of this, of this research workflow? Um, I'm going to show a couple of, of charts that others have created. This one is from the 101 Innovations uh, uh, Project, and I'd, I'd commend to you a, a variety of the different um, charts that they've, that they've put together, schematics that they've put together. The three here that you can see are first the, the workflow that Elsevier um, has been developing, acquiring, and now <coughs> controls. Uh, the workflow that digital science has been uh, developing, acquiring, and, and now controls. And then uh, finally, the one uh, with Clarivate. And, and I'm going to focus on these three for, for just a moment, because although there are other players and other competitors in the space, there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation, of acquisition and consolidation around startups um, in, in the research workflow process that, that these three companies have clearly been pursuing. They haven't developed identical uh, 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 portfolios to one another, um, but they are selling uh, in increasingly sophisticated uh, ways a portfolio, a bundle of research workflow tools that ultimately, in so at least one or two of these cases, is getting closer and closer to something that could become an end-to-end, -end sort of closed, locked-in system. None of them are yet fully developed in that way today, but could over time move in that, in that sort of, of direction. Um, there are some very interesting uh, news just looking at these three companies. Clarivate just the other day acquired Capernio, which is a, an access provision tool. Um, and then now to move on to an, just another version of how you can look at these verticals. Some of you will have seen a version of this slide just, uh, just, just 30 or 45 minutes ago in Tom Kramer's talk. Uh, this is, this is a, a slide that he's, a PDF that he's created, I believe. Um, you know, again, looking at, at the Clarivate vertical, the Elsevier vertical, the digital science vertical, and thinking about the open stack and whether there can emerge or will emerge an, an open stack. And one of the things that's really um, 
one of the questions that's embedded for us all strategically in this space is whether digital science, which is owned by Holtzbrink, which owns 53% of Springer Nature, is in fact has a publishing house, the second largest commercial scientific publishing house attached to it or not. And that's something that is actually a, a deeply important question in understanding whether Clarivate, as it claims, is more independent and neutral than, than, the, other, than the other two of Elsevier and, and digital science. A anyway, these questions are of profound importance to the scientists on our campuses and, and our work to support academic science, but they're not just important to scientists, and this is where I'll turn back to Don. So as Roger and I have been um, talking uh, about these issues, the, the debates we have are, okay, well, this is fine for the sciences, um, but tell me about what's going on in the other parts of the academy. Uh, and we're, and even in um, Tom, Tom's talk in the last session, he ended kind of mumbling that, sorry, Tom, if you're here, <laughs> that, oh, well, we really don't count for the humanities because that's too hard. So why is it too hard? The, um, the slides that Roger just showed you gave you a structure for that sort of mess that I showed you of the, the surrounding um, uh, interest around the, the core academic processes. The structure here, it's very clear the verticals that are emerging. But what we haven't really talked about much is the humanities research workflow. And at Mellon, we came to this, this functional diagram here, trying to make sense of some of the grant making that we've been doing in humanities publication and in, in the digital humanities. Uh, and you will recognize some of these functions if you go back to um, John Unsworth's uh, article about uh, the research primitives. Uh, I haven't captured all, I think it was 12 that he identified, but you can see the line here. And when we've tried to present this to faculty, they get it right away. Part the way that humanities work uh, proceeds is that you start with an evidence base, you gather sources, um, you catalog or organize them, not catalog in the sense of a library cataloging them, but uh, organizing them with various kinds of retrievable um, metadata and so on. Uh, you manage those, uh, you begin managing those uh, sources either by translating or transcribing them so that they're usable. Um, you have to spend lots of time identifying people, places, other entities that are embedded in those sources. Uh, and then you begin to annotate and interpret them. I've left off this slide of workflow, the publishing part of that workflow. Um, but, I, but the main point here is that over the last two decades, each of these functions have been embedded in digital services, um, with digitization being a, a new way of gathering sources, um, various kinds of online uh, description mechanisms uh, to catalog them, um, the ability to mechanically translate or transcribe using optical character recognition, um, various kinds of entity-based systems linked open data uh, for uh, organizing uh, those entities. Uh, and then re more recently, uh, standardization of annotation models. And what we've, if you go down to sort of turning these uh, uh, services into products, if you look around the digital humanities space, a lot of these uh, functions have now been turned into various kinds of products. Um, I've listed here uh, a bunch of them that Mellon has been supporting over the years, um, but there are lots of others. And so the question here is having this kind of maturation in the um, humanities space, are we now ripe for the same kind of uh, consolidation and organization of uh, these products that uh, Roger has pointed out is happening in the sciences? And so that leads us to a sort of broad set of questions. What is the problem here? And we'll, we want to open this up uh, to you. Uh, and hear your feedback and engage uh, your thoughts here in, in these questions. 
The main point that we've tried to articulate here is that there's, a, there's, there's an uneven development in the academy. And that when we talk about this kind of uh, commercialization, we're talking about a sector of the academy. Lots of money there, a big sector, no doubt. But it's a sector, not the entire academy. Does that portend what's ha going to happen in these other sectors that are less mature? Open question. And you can see here the, the other kinds of questions that we have um, raised. Um, what are the institutional interests? When you have competing companies like what you see in the, uh, in the consolidation that's going on in the sciences, what is the institutional, the library's interest, the, the uh, university or college's interest in, um, in working on that uh, and in resisting it or encouraging it or shaping it in some way? And does it matter that it's being commercialized? And is this connected so closely to scale issues in the web that a commercialization, whether it's for-profit commercialization or not-for-profit commercialization, is that inevitable in the, uh, in the way that this dynamic is currently working? So those are the questions that we want to pose to you, and we would like to hear from you. Please. No, thank, thank you, thank you everyone. I do think that was uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>